Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome to the very first module of this course language culture and cognition and introduction. This is module 1 part 1 lecture 1. This part will be uh, basically an introduction to the course, the historical perspectives, the background information, how the field uh, came into being all that will be covered in this first module. So, for the part 1 here is a road map the this is how we will proceed. First we will discuss about the nature of human thought, the very fundamental aspect of human thoughts and how the understanding of the same has been over centuries. So, we will take historical perspectives from India and the Greek tradition that is basically the ancient uh, in the ancient world how the understanding about human thought developed. And then we will move on to the place of language in this particular understanding in thought and in cognition. Again we will look up uh, historical records as to how these ideas were developed through centuries in various ancient civilization up to the modern time. And modern time as we mentioned in the introduction cognitive science came into being in the 1950s. So, that uh, event was termed cognitive revolution which has shaped our understanding of language and its relationship with cognition and culture to a large extent. So, cognitive revolution deserves an, an analysis on its own. So, we will look at cognitive revolution after that and then we move on to what is cognition, what are the definitional aspects of it, what does it cover and so on. And then we will move on to language and its place in symbolic cognition as in cognitive uh, science has had its own trajectory of development. There are many uh, branches of it, initial understanding of cognition, initial understanding of human mind and its working have changed a lot over, uh, over the last few decades. So, we will look at first the symbolic cognition and how language is placed within symbolic cognitive understanding of the human mind and then there are some issues with symbolic cognition as far as language is concerned. There are disagreements, there are debates, there are uh, controversies. We will look at those challenges that cognitive uh, science faced in terms of symbolic cognition and its relationship with language. And then uh, uh, while doing so, we will discuss some of the greatest uh, thinkers of the time and how they uh, tackled with this situation. And then we will move on to the embodied uh, understanding of cognition and how language is placed within this particular domain. And then we will move on to the fundamental aspects of embodied cognition as far as language is concerned which takes into account perception, action and their relationship with language. So, this is the road map that we will follow and we will we'll come to the modern time as to how language and its relationship with culture and cognition actually shaped up. So, to understand any domain of knowledge to understand any discipline one needs to go back to the history. How did it develop into what it is today? Needless to say the same will be done here as well. So, we will look at the nature of human thought as it developed over centuries of human endeavor. Now, the cognition the word cognition is relatively new. It has been used only for few decades now or maybe uh, uh, probably a few couple of centuries not older than that. However, the fundamental understanding of cognition which means the acquisition of knowledge, how we acquire knowledge and how we utilize this knowledge in our day to day life 
this fundamental understanding has been around for a very very long time. Cognition in terms of the in terms of its reference to the working of the human mind has been around for a very long time. Scholars from time immemorial have been intrigued about the nature of human thought. How does the human brain work? How do we know what is the subject matter of knowledge and so on has always intrigued the uh, scholars from ancient times. In fact, these are these ideas, these questions have been the um, primary questions that the philosophers, the oldest philosophers have always asked. In fact, the philosophers are called the first cognitive scientists, the oldest cognitive scientists. So, that is how um, far back this goes. As far as ancient, um, if we look at, if we talk about ancient civilizations and their understanding, we uh, one of the ancient civilizations is the Indian, Indian tradition, the Hindu civilization, uh, the Indic civilization. So, in this civilization in Indian tradition, we see there is a distinction made between Jnana and Vijnana. These two kinds of knowledge are the knowledge of the perceptible facts of the world that is out there in the world. However, there is a difference between these two kinds of knowledge systems. Jnana is Bahin Mukhi, it can be acquired through senses, then the knowledge that you acquire through senses like your eyes is Jnana. On the other hand, Vijnana is the, lang is the knowledge that needs an introspection, that needs drishti as opposed to uh, seeing as opposed to vision and it needs sadhana basically meaning introspection that is something that is already there inside you, you need to understand it, you need to introspect to get there. Similarly, Vidya also has been divided into Paravidya and Aparavidya as far as Upanishads are concerned. So, Paravidya is the knowledge of the ultimate, the Brahman that is the realm of metaphysical. On the other hand, Aparavidya is the knowledge of the worldly domain that is something that is at the level of day to day life, regular life. So, there is a distinction between what is everyday life and what is metaphysical, what is higher, what is transcendental. In the Jain tradition again there is a distinction made on similar lines. So, the distinction between Pratyaksha Jnana and Paroksha Jnana. Again the similar kind of distinction we see Jnana that is knowledge based on senses as opposed to knowledge based on reasoning, knowledge based on transcendental facts, the metaphysical world and so on. So, there is a clear distinction between what can be achieved, what kind of knowledge can be achieved through senses and what kind of knowledge needs introspection, higher order thinking. Similar distinctions were made by the Greek philosophers as well. Greek philosophers uh, can be divided into pre-Socratic and post-Socratic uh, philosophers. In the Greek tradition of pre-Socratic philosophers, we see similar kind of uh, distinction made into knowledge of the worldly affair as an knowledge of the transcendental. Here I have um, added a few names of the most important um, scholars in the pre-Socratic era. You can see some of them of course, uh, talked about the fundamental aspect of the universe and the debate on those fundamental aspects. Um, for example, uh, somebody said it is the water, somebody said it is the air and so on. Pythagoras for example, said number and mathematics is fundamental because it has no end. And we will see Pythagoras has been revisited in the modern times, even in the age of cognitive science. So, it goes back the understanding of human knowledge and how we arrive at human knowledge actually goes back very, very long time. And then we also see that Pythagoras takes uh, a stand that man is the measure of all things, probably bringing in the idea of relativity for the very first time. And then of course, there are um, many others for example, um, uh, one no such thing as knowledge that is only opinion that is also a standpoint taken by another philosopher. So, there is nothing human have humans are limited in their capacity. So, you cannot really achieve true knowledge, real knowledge that is beyond human. You can only have opinion that is the limitation of humans and so on. It goes on like this when there are many, many um, uh, standpoints and then we go on to the post-Socratic Greek philosophers. Of course, the, uh, the name of Plato looms very, very large, Plato is relevant even today. As for Plato, 
purest forms of knowledge was already implanted in every human being. It does not have to be created, it is already there, every human being is born with the purest form of knowledge. The task is to bring it out in the, in the, into the realm of consciousness. This is what we see in, uh, in Meno, where the, the dialogue between Socrates and the boy and the slave boy brings out this particular understanding of knowledge. The boy already has the knowledge about geometry, about mathematics and so on already in him. The task of the, uh, the interlocutor is to bring out that knowledge. So, knowledge is already there, you are born with knowledge. In a very interesting discussion, uh, you can see this, uh, this goes on, how do you know what is knowledge? How do you even know when you find it, because you do not know what it is and so on. So, this kind of discussions have been um, part of Greek philosophy for a very long time, the nature of knowledge and where knowledge resides, is it in the mind or is it beyond or is it within consciousness or outside of it and so on. And then in Republic, Plato puts forward the theory of tripartite soul or psyche as he calls it. The soul is at least logically divided into three parts, there you see reason, spirit and desire. So, you see reason is a separate entity even within the basic human psyche, basic human uh, what he calls soul. Reason is however, rash, uh, responsible for rational thought as far as spirit and appetite or desire is concerned, they are not capable of creating rational thought. Rational thought depends on reason alone. We will move on to Aristotle as a course as a matter of course and Aristotle however, takes a slightly different uh, take on this idea of knowledge. He agrees that humans are desirous of knowledge. Observation through senses allow understanding of appearances. So, Aristotle gives some importance to the senses, the input, the sensory input that humans get from the universe gives us an idea about the appearances of things in the world. Of course, understanding takes place in the mind, but it also needs the help of the information acquired through senses. Aristotle goes on to also delineate the four causes or as somebody says becauses of explanatory adequacy that one needs to answer in order to have full knowledge of anything. In fact, he says how do you know that you know something? In order to understand that question you have to answer the four becauses of the particular event. So, as far as the older uh, traditions are concerned in the Greek uh, philosophy. Plato says that only reason is enough, Aristotle does give some importance to senses. In the later ages, the Greeks theories about the nature of knowledge continued to reverberate through western intellectual tradition through ages. In fact, the Greek tradition have informed and uh, enriched the in a western tradition, a western intellectual tradition. In the middle ages, the questions about knowledge were in the purview of theologians. So, in starting with the Greek when the understanding of knowledge, understanding the of uh, how we arrive at knowledge, how we know what, a, what is pure knowledge, true knowledge were in the purview of philosophers. Over a period of time things changed, the world changed and theologians started um, uh, discussing these questions and in, in the uh, from a very different perspective. And then during the renaissance and enlightenment period philosophers again took reign of the discussion and they continued the understanding, continued the research in this domain, gradually bringing in the empirical findings from various newly emerging sciences. During the renaissance, during the enlightenment period in the western, um, western world, there were many new disciplines, many new sciences as they were called came into being, which depended on empirical findings, which depended on, which depended on data from uh, uh, inquiries and those inquiries, those data, those empirical evidence were also included in the in this particular uh, discipline. The names, some of the names that were uh, very very significant that are relevant even today, we still uh, look at their findings, we still look at their uh, theoretical standpoint. Some of them are Descartes, Rene Descartes and uh, Jean Battista Vico, who uh, uh, who did not of course agree with each other, and then you have Locke, Kant, and so on. So, there are all these, um, this is how old the, the discussion goes on and Descartes in the 17th century, Descartes and uh, Vico in the 17th century are very, very important as we will see uh, shortly. Descartes is 
one of the most looming figure among the rationalists. Rationalists are those people who believe that knowledge can be acquired only through reasoning. It cannot be acquired through uh, senses. So, Descartes is among the most pioneering figures among the rationalists. He set out to find out the basis of certain knowledge. How do you know that this is what is certain knowledge, this is what is final true knowledge. Now, he was aware of hallucinations and illusions and such things. If you can, he say, he, he very pertinently asked, if the senses can be fooled, how can the knowledge gained through senses be certain? You, the senses might have been fooled, even when you are thinking you have gained some knowledge through it. So, it has to be reason, it has to be devoid of the emotional uh, bondages, it has to be reason and that alone will take us to certain uh, knowledge. Mind must be separate from the body, mind does not and should not interact with the body. This is the famous Cartesian dualism, the mind body problem as it came to be known much later. And this Cartesian dualism we will come back to every now and then in this course. So, as you can see from this very brief introduction to the background of how the, the how the knowledge system, how the inquiry into human knowledge and how the human mind generates knowledge uh, is concerned, there are primarily two schools of thought as of now um, as to how true knowledge can be acquired. So, roles of senses and experiences versus the role of reason, logic and certainty. On the basis of this, we have two schools, one is called the rationalist, the other is called the empiricist and these are some of the uh, most famous uh, proponents of this theory, some of the most famous uh, names in this uh, two schools. You have Plato, Descartes and Kant and one in, in uh, rationalists and in empiricists, you have Aristotle, Locke, Hume. Mill and so on and logical positivists. These two themes have recurred in history for centuries as we have seen starting from the Indian tradition going to tra Greek tradition coming to the, um, the European tradition in the renaissance and in the during the uh, uh, intellectual developments in during the 17th century onwards we see that the two themes have remained more or less the same more or less this, this have been repeated over and over again. So, rationalists believing that mind has the power of reasoning which it imposes on the world of sensory experience. On the other hand, rationalists insisting that, that uh, mental either reflect or are constructed on the basis of sensory inputs. So, the mind the understanding the knowledge system is based on sensory inputs. So, these are the two. Thus, there is a continuity of the central question of the human mind since a really, really long time. Only now, Cognitive scientists depend on empirical methods for testing their hypothesis regarding the same. Because in the initial times, in the initial uh, days, there was the philo when, when it was philosophers looking at the question, there was no empirical evidence. However, now we have now things have changed, science has taken giant leaps, and with the advent of cognitive science, of course, we have a lot of uh, new machineries to look into empirical evidence. So, now we have um, a different uh, uh, mechanism to look at the same question in the modern age. Before we move on further into the finer and in, into the smaller aspects of it, into the details of it, let us talk about language, how the understanding of language, how the what is the role of language in thought process, what is the role of language in cognition, how important has language been for philosophers, for thinkers, for scholars over the ages, we will look at it in short. Again, we go back to the ancient civilizations, we have uh, available data from Indian tradition as well as Greek tradition. So, in the ancient Vedic texts of India, which are among the oldest available texts in the world, distinction was made between language directed towards gods and language for mundane use. In the initial stages in the Vedic uh, time, language was not really uh, taken in terms of cognition. However, we are looking at language from perspective of uh, religious, religious relevance as well as for mundane day to day life. Language was bestowed the power to invoke the gods. Now, the gods had to be um, pleased through the use of prayers. So, though it is the gods who would fulfill the worshippers uh, wishes, it is the language of the prayer and of the, and the priest that made it possible. 
as a result of which language one particular aspect of language had almost become godlike. So, it, it led to the deification of language and eventually giving rise to what we see as the goddess of language, the Vag Devi. On the other hand, of course, we have the mundane language. In a slightly later tradition, uh, Vedic tradition of the Brahmanas, the significance of language takes a very different turn. Now, the belief system changes and since uh, the understanding is that the since uh, Brahman, the ultimate creative force is beyond human language, is beyond human uh, characterization, we cannot really characterize it, it is beyond our power and hence no language can reach it directly. Knowledge contained in language is inadequate to reach the Brahman, which is characterized by silence. So, in this time, during this time, the understanding of language changes significantly and only a syllable, the syllable om gets some kind of a sacred status and it is understood that it represents the sound om represents the creative force behind the creation of universe. So, this is, this is a uh, important change in, in course of time. Even later during the uh, during about 400 BCE, there were gra famous grammarians Panini, Patanjali, uh, Katyayana and others were creating uh, writing grammars and writing treatises on languages and so on. At this time we see there is a shift of attention to the in terms of language, um, in, in terms of language meaning and its representation. So, we have shifted from the godly aspects of language to the uh, more, more mundane aspects of language in terms of meaning and how it is represented. So, uh, they actually this is when the philosophical understanding of language starts um, to emerge in Indian tradition. So, Patanjali's Mahavashya discusses the debate about the nature of word meaning and it comes to the conclusion that a word refers to the individual referent as well as the category of to which that individual referent belongs. For example, the word parrot represents not only a parrot or a particular individual entity called a particular parrot, but it also represents the parrotness of that entity. This is um, how this is the standpoint of Patanjali. This early philosophical debate gets expanded and argued in the later tradition of the Nyaya Vaisheshikas and the Mimangshikas. There are also series of arguments as to whether words are sequences of sounds and why it cannot be as per Katyayana. The understanding is that once you have pronounced a particular sound, it is gone forever when it is replaced by another sound and it is followed by another sound and so on. So, how do you uh, see the whole word at the same time? It cannot how it, it is not possible to have words to be a sequence of sounds. But Patanjali finds a way around this uh, problem by using his ideas of mental storage of comprehension, perhaps the first among grammarians to talk about mental storage as far as comprehension is concerned. A little later, Bhatrahari in the 400 CE contributed towards philosophical understanding of both structure and function of language. So, in his Vakyapadya, he claims that language constitutes the ultimate principle of reality. Shabda Brahman. What we see in Vartrahari actually comes back to us in the modern times in slightly different form. Vartrahari assigns primacy to sentence both in structure and in meaning. So, he says ac according to his theory a sentence is understood as a whole not word by word not after not uh, you know we do not understand word by word we understand the whole sentence at one go that is what uh, that is a that is a strong departure from Mahavashya. However, again as is the nature of scholarly uh, pursuits, there are debates on this and then uh, his ideas are uh, later on discarded and it is um, largely rejected by the uh, later schools of philosophy and um, as well as by later grammarians like Kandavatta and um, Nagesh, Nageshvatta. And there are many more new theories that take uh, its place. So, basically it uh, shows the Indian tradition basically reflects that from, from the beginning there was uh, there is the, the language has been taken very seriously and language has been looked at uh, as, as far as its power and how it represents thought and so on. Um, now, we move on to the Greek tradition. 
Plato was of the opinion that thought and language, thought and knowledge can be independent of language, because ultimately as we have seen it is reason alone that can take us to certain knowledge. Words can merely help the hearer recollect what he already knows, since humans are uh, born with all the knowledge that is there, uh, that is possible, all the possible knowledge. Knowledge is internal and knowledge is inbuilt, it is eternal. On the other hand, sophists by virtue of their command of rhetoric to influence opinions relied heavily on language and they were as a result of which they were criticized. Socrates had more in common with sophists than with Plato and Aristotle because he too depended on and advocated about the power of language. In modern times uh, until Frege, language would be discussed in connection with philosophical speculations like meaning, understanding, reference and truth like we have seen in the uh, Indian tradition as well as Greek tradition. So, la as far as language is concerned, the primary questions to be asked was how, uh, what is the relationship between words and meaning, how is it represented, how, uh, what does it refer to and so on. However, these were not discussed with relation to topics like knowledge, mind, substance and time and so on, which are considered unrelated to language. They are not part of integral part of language, but they are outside of language and this discussion was not very common before Frege's time. In the modern world, philosophers have often engaged with the issue of language as one of the central themes. Although they often disagree on how this influence works, but the fundamental understanding that language has some connection with the mental mechanisms has been sort of constant uh, ever since the time of Frege and Russell. Frege and Russell in fact are in uh, uh, credited with initiating the turn, linguistic turn in Anglo-American um, philosophical understanding of human mind. So, they, they, they gave a lot of importance to language. Frege for example, showed that the fundamental uh, advances in mathematics could be made by studying the language used to express mathematical thought. One must uh, um, take a pause here and understand the difference between the language that Frege is talking about and the language of everyday life. Frege is not interested in everyday ordinary language, he is talking about the logical language, a language that is reasonable, that is that can be used for expressing mathematical thought, it is the mathematical language, the logical language. So, for Frege and Russell, the propositions of logic and mathematics are pristinely independent of sense experience. So, here we see a repeat of the understanding of language, of uh, understanding of reason and its, uh, and its role in getting, creating knowledge. So, even when they are looking at uh, language, they are looking at a language that is devoid of the sensory experiences, depending for their truth only on the structures of the abstract world they describe. A world made accessible to human beings through the light of pure reason. So, language as long as it is reflecting pure reason as far as it is reflecting logic in its purest form is relevant for thought, not the language of everyday life that is dependent on sensory experiences. That is the, that is the standpoint that we see here, because Frege's main interest was to create an artificial formal language that is suitable for mathematics and logic both. It has, as a result of which it has to be a language that is logically perfect. Natural language as far as Frege is concerned is too vague and it is not good enough and it is uh, too vague and ambiguous in fact, for the purpose of logic. However, he agrees that some aspects of natural language probably in parts can be said to be logical as well, but largely it is not. Russell on the other hand has taken a stronger position and he says that language is transparent, it has it is just a medium that can be used uh, uh, without giving it much thought, it is just a medium. Now, we look at Ludwig Wittgenstein, one of the one of the uh, foremost uh, philosophers of our times of, uh, of um, in, the, in, the, in the understanding of human thought, human knowledge system and so on. Wittgenstein is specifically interesting because he took two different standpoints during his um, uh, in, in his own lifetime. In the initial, um, in, in his initial understanding that is reflected in uh, Tractatus as it is formally, uh, as it is commonly understood and uh, commonly called, he talks about language 
uh, in terms of a picture. He talks about picture theory of language. Language merely represents the world by depicting it. It just refers, it just gives a picture of the, uh, of the, of the things in life and it just re uh, reflects it into the brain. It does not create anything, it has no other role to play. So, propositions are basically pictures of facts as it happens in real life. Right? Words are names of objects. So, there is something that happens in the world, language simply get, takes a picture of it and depicts it in the human brain. Thus, language simply provides a way of looking through the structure of the world. However, ordinary language that does not follow the logical construction are senseless. They do not make much sense and they are not useful as far as understanding and thought and human mind is concerned. He treated language and meaning as independent of how ordinary use, ordinary humans use them. However, he takes a very, uh, he himself changes his opinion towards the, uh, in, the, in the second part of his life, in the later part of his life and as we see uh, in philosophical investigations that his later philosophy represents a complete repudiation of the notion of an ideal language. So, initially he was talking about an ideal language that reflects the world as it is, there is no other, there is no distraction, it is simply a picture that gives a picture of the world as it is factually, ideal language, kind of logical language. Now he says there is no direct or infallible foundation of meaning for an ideal language to make transparent. There is a strong departure. There is no definitive set of conceptual categories for an ideal language to employ. So, there is no given word, there is no ideal conceptual category that the language simply can transfer as it is to the brain. Ultimately, there can be no separation between language and life and words get meaning by the context of use, which he initially rejected. So, now he says that language use is very important and it cannot be, uh, it cannot be uh, separated from the use, from the context of use and the use itself and meaning must be generated through that. Later Wittgenstein gave more weightage to language than philosophy itself. His claim was that there are no philosophical problems, only language puzzles. Karl Popper famously disagreed as any of you who are interested in language, uh, interested in philosophy would know. There was a lot of debate, a lot of controversy around that, a lot of disagreements. However, later Wittgenstein makes a fundamental shift from the early Wittgenstein in giving context of language use a center stage. So, the new debate basically uh, uh, can be uh, boiled down to this. On the one hand, you have relation between meaning and truth of which you have proponents like early Wittgenstein, Davidson and Quine and so on. On the other hand, you have on the other side of the debate, you have later Wittgenstein, Grice, Austin Searle and so on, who talked about meaning and use of language, not truth. So, on the one hand, you have language as a reflector of truth as it exists in the world, a pre-given fact that is there. On the other hand, you have the, on the other side of the debate, you have the um, philosophers arguing that language and meaning are more important than the truth, because truth may not be um, fundamental, truth may not be uh, given, it may not be objective for all conditions. Now, we move on to a slightly later time and, and a very interesting time for that matter, it, uh, the build up of cognitive science, how cognitive science came into being. Like any new uh, discipline that comes into being, like any, any new domain of knowledge that comes into being, it, it is the work of many, many scholars, it is the work across uh, many decades and so on. The same happened for the emergence of cognitive sciences in the 1950s. When cognitive sciences emerged in the 1950s, the dominant theoretical standpoint was behaviorism in psychology and in language and in other domains. The two most uh, foremost names that uh, started challenging this particular um, standpoint of behaviorism are Carl Lashley and Noam Chomsky. Of course, there are many others, but we will see why they are important in terms of our, uh, for our purposes, for the purpose of language. Lashley, for example, said that the problems raised by the organization of language 
seems to me to be characteristic of almost all other cerebral activities. Behaviorism predicted that there is a continuous stimulus response feedback loop that makes us um, that, that is responsible for all the behavioral output. So, you see you, you learn you make a mistake and then you course correct and so on and if you go correct that is a positive feedback and then you uh, take the next step and so on. But Lashley said that that, that cannot happen for all kinds of uh, mental mechanisms. For example, he gives the examples of um, behaviors, organized behaviors like playing tennis, performing a musical instrument and speaking which may not probably depend on such a loop because it will be so time consuming. There is no time to really wait for the feedback and then plan your next move and so on. This has to be already pre-planned. There has to be, uh, he said this behaviors cannot be dependent on stimulus response system because this is this is so this is uh, this, this needs to be pre-planned and this has to be hierarchically organized. There has to be a plan and there has to be an execution down the chain. So, it cannot be dependent on stimulus response systems and for language the highest node in this hierarchy would be the intention behind the utterances. We do not speak in a vacuum there are intentions, there are, there are reasons why we speak. So, intentions are the highest nodes in that hierarchy of mental functions as far as language is concerned. And after that comes the syntax and actual production at the lower nodes. The nervous system contains an overall structure within which individual units are positioned. Lastly, seminal paper put language firmly in the domain of mental states. Earlier, the, earlier uh, the idea was language is a stimulus response behavior. You can teach language to a child and then uh, the child learns to speak and so on. So, you teach them uh, child uh, makes mistakes and then you correct the mistake and then he learns the, near, the correct form of it and so on. This is something that lastly challenged and he says language cannot be dependent on stimulus response. It has to be already present there. So, this is he is one of the first to put language as a core me mechanism of the uh, human mental functions and which is adequately supported by the neural architecture. Similarly, Chomsky in his um, paper in the symposium on information theory in 1956, the paper titled Three Models of Language outlined how uh, Shannon's information uh, theoretic account does not apply to natural language. He exhibited his own approach to grammar based on transformations. He for the first time among linguists set out to demonstrate that language has formal precision like mathematics. That is an algorithmic structure, there is a fundamental structure that all languages have which he called uh, universal grammar which humans are born with. And he had, he is one of the foremost critics of behaviorist uh, theory of language learning. So, these are these, uh, these thinkers, these scholars are in the uh, background uh, in the build up of uh, uh, cognitive science, uh, the beginning of cognitive science and the cognitive revolution happens in the nine, uh, 1950s. Uh, in the mid part of 20th century was marked with remarkable advancement. How does, the, how did cognitive science came into being? It was marked by, uh, it was preceded by a lot of advancement in uh, the science of human mind in the in the in the in the understanding of the science of human mind in the in the beginning of ai the birth of ai computer science giant steps taken by neurosciences all these developments were already building up a new uh, discipline on the human sciences side psychology was going through changes in very very important ways earlier key issues of mental faculty were issued uh, were addressed by introspection method followed by behaviorism. During this time, during the run up to cognitive revolution, behaviorism was challenged severely as we have just seen in Lashley and Chomsky's uh, work, but there were many others also. So, behaviorism faced a lot of challenges during this time. Late 1940s onward, there were some landmark conferences that actually consciously brought together philosophers, psychologists, cognitive um, computer scientists, AI specialists most specifically and neuroscientists and linguists together in order to really uh, discuss about this, discuss about uh, the possibilities of working together to look at how the human mind 
works. And this is how gradually through these conferences a new discipline named cognitive science emerged. For one, these conferences brought together stakeholders from so many disciplines who agreed upon the fundamental fact that human mind needs to be understood with empirical evidence and there needs to be a collaborative work between disciplines to really understand the final mechanisms and that is why it is the cognitive science is an essentially interdisciplinary uh, domain. So, these are some of the conferences, some of the funds that actually um, organized those conferences. One of them was Hickson fund that uh, had uh, these conferences called cerebral mechanisms of in behavior. Then we had um, symposium on information theory and then of course, the Messi conferences. These were uh, extremely important, these were instrumental in ultimately the emergence of cognitive science as a discipline. Now, once cognitive science uh, as a discipline has already emerged, now there are new definitions, there are new ways, a uh, new uh, way of framing the fundamental questions of cognition. So, what is cognition? The primary subject matter of cognitive science is cognition. It refers to knowing the collection of mental processes and activities used in thinking, understanding, perceiving, learning and remembering and of course, the act of using these processes. And by now, this the crucial subjects in these domains uh, irrefutably are the following learning and memory, thinking and reasoning, language, decision, vision perception, social cognition, dreaming, consciousness and so on. Within cognitive science, there were different trajectories of development. In the initial part, in the initial uh, years, the symbolic cognition or standard cognitive science was um, the most important one, the primary that, that was the primary standpoint. So, the primary theoretical position it takes is that human thought is symbolic and the processes of human mind are analogous to that of a computer. This is because, this happened because the fundamental uh, force that drove the beginning of cognitive science was the uh, necessity to, uh, necessity for from the perspective of artificial intelligence AI. Artificial intelligence tried to create a computer that thinks and uh, works like the human brain. Now, if you want to create a machine that works like the human brain, you need to understand the human brain first. So, the analogy between the human brain and the computer basically was at the forefront of uh, various kinds of uh, inquiries during this time. The mind is as a result of which the mind came to be uh, thought of as a symbol system and cognition is abstract, arbitrary and is just a symbol manipulating system. So, everything that you do, everything that cognition uh, includes for example, all this learning, memory, thinking, reasoning, language, vision perception, everything is ultimately a symbol manipulating system. So, the mind has symbols and it manipulates those symbols with respect to various kinds of goal that we have uh, in our uh, at a given point of time. So, even the process that involves sensory organs controlled by neural signals are simply a type of symbol manipulating system. So, what are symbols? Naturally, if the mind is a symbol manipulating system, it has to have symbols. So, what are basically symbols? Symbols are a set of physical arbitrary tokens. It can be anything, it can be a sketches of on a paper, holes on a tape, even um, events in a digital computer and so on and so forth, which have to be, which need to be manipulated by um, a set of rules. Those rules are fixed, there cannot be um, too much of, um, there cannot be any deviation from those fixed rules, they are explicit and they are fixed. Similarly, words and numbers are also symbols. Symbols stand for something, symbol basically means it stand for something. So, words are symbols in the way that a word like elephant stands for a large animal with certain particular features. So, when the once we say elephant, it means something, it is some there is something out there that for which it stands. Similarly, number 12 stands for number 12 and so on. Symbols can combine as per fixed rules to create a new symbol. So, if we combine various symbols meaning various words like I, saw, an, 
elephant, we combine them in terms of some fixed rule and then we create a new symbol I saw an elephant. The same rule um, prohibits a situation like a, a new uh, creation of a new uh, symbol like elephant saw I an, which means that the rules are fixed, rules are uh, there are legal operations and there are illegal operations that is the correct operation and incorrect operation. So, the rule uh, your, uh, rule governed phenomena of the symbol manipulating system gives us only I saw an elephant and it does not give us elephant saw I n. So, I, so, this is how the symbol manipulating system works in terms of language. Thinking involves operations on words in an internal language. So, when we think that is an internal language in the, the like the logical language that we that uh, was talked about by Frege and Russell and many others. So, the there is an internal language in our brain with which we think and that language has the that language follows a certain set of rules. In other words cognition relies on language as far as this particular standpoint is concerned. Another important issue about language in symbolic cognition is the feature of arbitrary relationship between words and their meanings. Words stand for something that we have already seen. So, uh, the word like elephant stands for a particular animal in the real world. However, there is no reason as to why that particular animal should be called an elephant. Th that means, the word its elephant itself has nothing elephant like so to say. So, the word does not have four legs, it does not have tusk, does not have a trunk and so on. So, that particular match between the word, the symbol and the, uh, and the entity that it symbolizes that, uh, that relationship is arbitrary. Similarly, neurons can also be thought of as symbols as they stand for the processes. Every neuronal uh, group stand for a process, they are activated when a process is a mental function is going on. And various neurons and groups of neurons that code for one concept can be combined with other such uh, groups to in order to create a new uh, concept in order to form a new concept. So, that way neurons can also be thought of as symbols and the entire process entire computation between the input and output. So, the input of the uh, various kinds of um, information that we have and the output that the brain gives uh, this entire process happens inside the human brain inside the mind of the human agent by simply manipulating those very symbols. Neuronal uh, architecture, ne ne the neural um, underpinning or this language and so on. Hence, since it is an enti entirely an internal affair, the outside world has no role to play in this entire mechanism, in this entire computation of thought process using language and so on and the neural uh, architecture there is no role of the external world on this. This is a very significant point that the symbolic cognition makes. So, it is an internal affair uh, entirely dependent on the symbol manipulation. Thank you.